Yeah, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 2. We were doing a study through Philippians. Now, we have Bibles for you. We actually, we, we, the screens aren't, the, the scriptures aren't on the screen, so if you, you're going to need a Bible. So just raise your hand up in the air, and we're going to stick one in your hand. Just hold it up, and Alex is going to bring one by and give you one of those. So or if you have one in your phone or whatever. We're going to be in the New King James Version. But we've been going through this great epistle. If you've been with us, um, Paul is in prison. He's in Rome. uh, And he's awaiting. He, you know, it was sort of his dream, actually, to get a chance to preach the gospel to the most powerful people in the Roman Empire. And uh, he took access of his, he was a Roman citizen, He was a Jewish man, a great scholar, a very religious man. Jesus got a hold of his life. And as a Roman citizen, he's going through the judicial process there in the Roman Empire. And now he's under house arrest. He's in Rome. And he's writing this letter to a church that he planted with uh, Timothy was with him. And of course, Luke, uh, Dr. Luke would have been with him chronicling all of this. And, and um, Silas was with him when they were planting this church. They got, actually got thrown into prison after even just a couple days. And uh, they were worshiping God. And even the, the lights went up. They kept, they had breath in their lungs. And they sang out to the Lord. And there was an earthquake. And, and, uh, and the gates opened. And so the, the whole history of this church plant in Philippi is just remarkable how he ministered to this, woman, this Jewish woman. She was a religious woman, and she comes to know Jesus as the Messiah. And then this demon-possessed uh, teenager came to know Christ just in a few days. And can you imagine that first home group, right, at the church plant of the church in Philippi? A, a jailer and a, demon, a, a delivered teenager, you know, and this, this very wealthy woman was there. And, and so an amazing work that God was doing in this city And throughout this letter, Paul is just pouring out his love to the people. There was a unique relationship that the Apostle Paul had with the church in Philippi. And throughout this letter, he's calling us to rejoice, which is remarkable because he's saying all these things, sitting, uh, he's in prison, he's chained to Roman guards 24 hours a day, but yet his heart is free. His heart is free in Christ and in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what we see in here is what God can do in the midst of our circumstances. God can put a song in our heart. God can put a joy in our heart. And it's an abiding joy that's not, uh, it's not quenched by the difficulties of life. And so we, we've said this over and over. Paul, what we see in him is he didn't see himself as a victim. He didn't see himself as a helpless man, a helpless palm uh, with circumstances that were beyond his control. And isn't that all of our lives? We, we've got circumstances that we just can't control. It just is. It is what it is. But what we have in the gospel, we, we, what we have are eternal resources in Jesus Christ. We, ha- a, a, we have a, a joy and a strength that comes by the Holy Spirit of God. And if you're here today and you're discouraged and you're facing some difficult times, your answer is in Jesus Christ. It's not in anything in this world. It's if you're going to look for circumstances to change, they might change, they might not change. But we serve a one and he's the unchanging one. His name's Jesus Christ. And he died for you and he rose again and he sits on the throne right now and he's in control. He's sovereign over our lives and in his sovereignty, he loves us with an everlasting love. And his grace is pouring out to you right now. Isn't that good news? And that's what this epistle is all about. So we're going to look at, I didn't get to 19 as you noticed last week. So we're going to actually look at verses 19. And I want to tag on chapter 3 verse 1 for a reason. So let's read through that. And then I want to pray. And then we'll get into our Bible study here. Okay, so Philippians 2 verse 19. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send them, to send him 
at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need, since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick, almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I send him the more eagerly that when you see him again, you may rejoice and may be less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with, with all gladness and hold such men in esteem. Because for the work of Christ, he came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service towards me. And then we see, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord for me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you, it is safe. And that's the point here. Paul keeps reminding us. He says, I, I don't tire of writing the same things to you. I mean, how often do you forget? I, I forget so often. God will show me something. God will speak something to me. I'll read something. I seem to forget it quickly. Are you, are you the same? I, that, it's, it's my problem. I couldn't find anything this morning. I couldn't find my Bible. couldn't find my watch. Then I drove to the church, and I left my backpack with my Bible at home, so I had to go back home. Anyway, um, I'm just with scatterbrain this morning, and Paul says, look, I'm right, I keep writing these things to you, and I love the NET version, because it is a safeguard to you, and we need that in life. In the dangers of life, we need a safeguard for our mind and for our heart. And so the purpose of Paul writing these things is so that we have a safeguard in a very dangerous world and in a very dangerous calling. And so what we have here in this passage, he holds up two men in the church, two men that are very close to him. And we're going to look at these two men, Timothy and Epaphroditus. Timothy and Epaphroditus. Now, to get us into the context, all right, what's Paul teaching on? Look back, go left, and if you see in verse 4, let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Okay, we talked about that. And now, the Apostle Paul, he gives to us, he talks to the church in Philippi, but we get this this morning about these two men of God. And I want to talk about being servants of the Lord. Quite specifically, what we studied in verse 15, that we would be like light bearers. When we know Jesus Christ and we have a joy that doesn't come through the circumstances of life, but it's a, an abiding joy that is rooted in our identity in Christ and the reality of our destination, with, which is heaven, we become light bearers in a, in a very dark world. And what we see here are two men, Timothy and Epaphroditus. These two men were light bearers. And I want to break apart this text. And we're going to learn a lot about them and a lot about ourselves in this passage. Timothy, his name means God honoring. So he was a God honorer. And we see as you study him throughout scripture, Timothy well, he was on Paul's first missionary journey, remember? He was preaching in Lystra, and he met Timothy. He was just a teenager, and his mother was a Jew and actually a believing Jew. His father was a Greek, and so he was half Jewish, half Greek. And, and, and so Timothy took, uh, Paul took Timothy on as kind of his young protege and said, I want you to come with me. I'm going to disciple you. And so Timothy, as a young man, was with Paul when they planted the church right here. And now we see here that Timothy is hanging out in Rome. He's actually, he, he's not in prison himself, but he is accompanying Paul in Rome, and he's with him. So in whatever sense, he's ministering to his needs. And, you know, Timothy was kind of a timid guy, okay? And we see when Paul writes to him in his letters to Timothy that he says, you know, God has not given us a spirit of timidity. And we, we learn a little bit about his character and his personality type um, uh, throughout the scripture when Paul speaks to him. Now, Epaphroditus, his name means charming. And what we see, even by the description here and even in, in Colossians, Epaphroditus, uh, he, was, he wasn't an 
introvert. He was an extrovert. He, he was a courageous man. He was a go for it kind of guy. He was like a sow, right? He's, he's just a go for it. Let's just take the bull by the horns and get it done. We see that he went out and he risked his life to bring a gift from the church in Philippi. They, they gave a financial gift to Paul and Epaphroditus was the one that brought it to Rome. And then he received this letter that we're studying and he took it back to the church in Philippi. That's Epaphroditus. These are two amazing guys. And what I love, when you, when you do character studies in, in the Bible, we, we, you know, a lot of times when we're just reading through the scriptures, we sort of pass over these. They're, they're, they're kind of minor characters, but not to Paul. These are major players in the spreading of the gospel, Timothy and Epaphroditus. And I love in the Bible that everyone matters. Have you ever done a study in the book of Nehemiah? And Nehemiah, three different times, the, a whole chapter is dedicated to just names. Names. What, have you ever been through a study and you'll, you'll, you know, just verse after verse, names, names. Why are all these names in here? Well, it's significant for the Jewish heritage that they're in there. But even more than that for us, what I love about that is that in the Bible and in God's work, everyone matters. Do you know that? Everyone matters. Everyone in this room matters. And as you look throughout scripture, I, I love when certain people are mentioned and that's what we're going to look at this morning. So let's look at Timothy first, okay? Timothy... We've, we see in verse 19, we see, and I mentioned that he's with Paul. That he's, he, 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 Paul wants him with him at that moment. And he's saying, I, uh, you know, I, I'm going to send him to you at the right time. But he actually wishes that he could go as well as we see here. He wants to see the church in Philippi again. But in verse 20, look, for I have no one like-minded who, who will sincerely care for your state. We get insight into Timothy's character, and we see that he's living out the exhortation that Paul is giving to the church in Philippi, that let this mind be with you that was also in Christ Jesus. And if you remember the study, what was this mind that was in Christ Jesus? He left heaven, the splendor of heaven, the glory of heaven, to rescue us. He left comfort, we could say, to put himself and to position himself in an uncomfortable situation, he laid down his life to redeem us. So when we let this mind be in us that, Christ, that was also in Christ, it means that there's a point in time in our walk with Jesus Christ, he calls us to leave what is comfortable, to insert ourselves in a circumstance and situation, to live redemptively. And living redemptively is not always easy street, is it? And so, when this mind is in us that is in Christ Jesus, and I guarantee, if we were to do a survey right now in this room, there's some great things going on in your life, there's some positive things, and there's some challenging things going on in your life. There's some wonderful relationships that you're blessed with in your life, but I guarantee we're all the same, there's some challenging relationships, okay? And when we let this mind be in us that was also in Christ Jesus, we lay down our life and we go, I am not in this situation. I am not in this relationship just for me and for my needs so I can feel good. But Lord, I want you to use me as your instrument to be redemptive in this circumstance. And how, how does that work out? By loving people. Loving people. Think about the most successful people you know. Just, you don't have to answer that, but since really... Just think about one or two, three people. Who in your, you might know them, you might not know them. The most successful people that you know of. Because when you study the Bible, you, you see that true success are loving relationships. Really at the end of the day, they, someone has said it well. Man, you are a success if at the end of your life on your deathbed, You've got the joy of heaven in your heart and you have two or three close friends by, your, by the side of your bed, right? That's true success. Hey, those of you who have been successful monetarily or maybe uh, in, in a certain occupation, you know that when you gain that success and you have it, 
The only thing that really matters at the end of it all is having re loving relationships. Isn't that true? That's true success. And so when I see Paul talking about Timothy, I see true success in this relationship. Timothy, he's my son. He, he, he sort of looks to him as, he's like one of my sons. And he's, he's talking about the family that we can have in, uh, in the body of Christ. But look here, he was like-minded. And, 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 and Paul said, you know, I have no one who will sincerely care for your state like Timothy. And so he's this awesome guy. He's this servant heart, and he's a man that is living redemptively in his life by laying down his life. For verse 21, for all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. Now that's a radical statement. And, and is he like, what's, what's his point of view that Paul has? We could either look at it like he's the only good guy I know, you could do that, or we could see this as a global statement, which I believe it is, as we read in Romans, for all have sinned and all fallen short of the glory of God. Before we start comparing ourselves with one another, let's all make the connection, which is true of us, for all seek their own. Amen? I don't have to wake up in the morning and seek my own. I already am seeking my own. It's in my DNA to seek my coffee just like I want it. Do I want room? Do I want, what do you want in there? What, you know, do, I want my eggs a certain way. I, I want, you know, I, I want, you know. We're, we wake up, we roll out of bed seeking our own. Can I get an amen on that? I mean, that's just who we are. That's just the state uh, of, our, of our character. And we live, especially in America, there is a plague of narcissism that sort of drives society, that drives our culture. And we're, we're even told at a very young age, right, you need to go out and do what makes you happy. And so we're told every day through every medium, it, it's the Western society, it's an egocentric society, it's the individualism of Western society that we are applauded for getting what we want. We are applauded by society by pleasing ourselves and making ourselves happy so that our neighbors and our friends, our family can look at our life and go, well, good for you. The life that you have created for yourself and how, and then we're envied by people, right? We're taught to live life th that way, but that is not the mark of true success. Let this mind be in you. Paul is saying, look at Timothy. He's laying down his life because all seek their own. But when we seek the things of Christ Jesus, we change the world. We change people's lives. The people that have impacted my life the most are people that have not looked out for their own interests, but they have loved me in spite of me. They have shown grace to me when they didn't have to. Those are the people that have impacted my life for eternity, for eternal things. And God is calling us. If we're going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, we walk with him. We, we follow him. He says, follow me. And what is Jesus doing when we're following him? He's getting on his knees and he's washing the feet of people. He's meeting the needs. He's taking the coat off his own back and he's giving it to another person. He's forgiving his enemies. He's not retaliating against an, another person. He's not thinking about another way that he can, you know, get around and get above his coworker. He's always getting underneath people and lifting them up as high as they can go. This is the servant heart of Jesus Christ. And when we're a follower of Jesus Christ, this is what we're doing. But we can't do it because I wake up and I seek my own. I need a power greater than me. And right now, if you're a Christian, you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, he lives inside of you. And he's given you the power to serve others. He's giving you the desire. He is. He's giving you the desire to be someone who you could never be uh, in your own strength. And it's the constant battle. And so when you see Timothy, uh, the, this character, he's saying, look, look at this man. He, he's, he, he's dedicated to service, right? 
but you know his proven character that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. So he sees Timothy not just as his partner, not just as his uh, staff. Look at my staff. He's saying, he's like a son to me. Do you know that that's what God is doing in the church? He invites us in to the community of Christ to make us a family. That's the level he wants to lead us to. Just as the Holy Spirit is constantly at work in you, giving you the desire and the supernatural ability to love the unlovely and serve others, the Holy Spirit is also in us collectively making us a family. That's what he's doing. We don't have to work too hard at it. We don't have to get weird about it, but we just allow the Holy Spirit to just start bonding his people together because that's what he's doing. God the Holy Spirit in me is the same God the Holy Spirit in you. You're my sister. You're my brother. We are part of the family of God, and we have been redeemed by Jesus Christ, by his shed blood. And we all have one Father, one Spirit, and it's one body, and it's one family. The church is not a building. It's not a name. It's not. The church is a church family. And that's what God is doing with us. And he's doing that at churches all over the world. He's making us a family. And I can't think of anything more exciting than that. And so when Paul thinks about Timothy, he's like, my son, this is my family. And so Paul loved this church. He loved Timothy. And then we get to Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus. He says here, I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, my fellow worker and fellow soldier. So Epaphroditus is about 800 miles journey for him to get from Philippi to Rome. Long journey. And as we read earlier, he risked his life. We'll get to that in a moment. But notice this about Epaphroditus and how Paul refers to him. Three things, okay? He's my brother. So he considered Epaphroditus part of his family too. This is, he's, he's my brother. And he's also my fellow worker, which speaks of fellowship. They were in the work of the Lord together, fellow worker. And then thirdly, fellow soldier. Three words, family, fellowship, fight. Family, fellowship, fight. Okay, God is making us a family as the body of Christ. He's doing it. He's also making us part of a fellowship, meaning that we're building something, that we're at work pouring our lives into the, the kingdom of God, that we're actually a part of building sort of a city within a city. Does that make sense? Well, what, what makes Thousand Oaks Thousand Oaks? What makes L.A. L.A.? What are, what are all the elements? You know, I, I travel, I've been able to travel all over the world, and each city is unique to what it offers. It's unique to its culture. It's u- unique to its, uh, to its foods. and It's unique in so many different ways. What makes a city a city? But when you talk about the kingdom of God, what makes God's people in the midst of the city, unique in that city? What makes them a light? And if you think about it, it's kind of like that. It's kind of like we're building a city within a city. Out in this city, it's a dog-eat-dog world, right? The, you know, he's who's smartest wins. You know, it's go out and make a bunch of money. Get a, you know, get a bigger house. Get, you know, and we're stepping over each other. We're pushing each other's side, trying to make it in this life, Okay. And that's the culture that we live in throughout the week. But what God wants to do, he's making us a family, but he's also making us a city where the rules are totally changed. It's like an upside down kingdom. It's like, you know, the, Bible, the kingdom of God is paradoxical. Every time Jesus taught, he was messing with everyone's minds. Right when you think you got Jesus figured out, he just went by, you know, he slammed Duncan right behind you, right? He's like, you think you got him, you don't. And it's almost like a comedy. It's like when you really think about it, how God was going to save the world by dying on a cross, which was a form of capital punishment. 
Did any of the disciples say, I get it. That's a really good idea. I see where you're going here with Jesus, you know. No. They're looking at going, this makes no sense. What, can good, what good can come from, from this? Because in God's kingdom, the weak are strong. The last are first. And we think it's like a comedy. It's like the nerdiest guy gets the girl. You know what I mean? It's like, that's the kingdom of God. It's like the best movie ever. The whole narrative of the gospel and the kingdom of God. You know what's awesome? Is there's hope for us. <laughs> because to lay a hold of that which Christ has laid hold of us is not, you, not through your perspiration and you trying harder. It's by us surrendering and humbling ourselves. And that's the kingdom of God. And what the city within a city means that people come through the gates of this city and life makes sense. That their pain makes, their pain has meaning. That uh, their struggles ha have a purpose because they're leading to something far greater than what we can get into this world. They're leading to eternal things that we can, you, you see what I'm saying? <laughs> That's, those are the values, those are the laws, those are what the street signs say in this city within a city. So Paul says, Epaphroditus, my fellow worker. So you see them together, side by side, in the work of the Lord. Doesn't that sound great? So we have family, we have a fellowship, and we talk about, and when I emphasize this, this is a church plant. And God wants to make a family, and he's also making a dynamic fellowship as we are fellow workers in the work of the Lord. And thirdly, fellow soldier. This is a fight. What, what a great passage. I mean, it's great how God times these things out. You know, here we are, Veterans Day. And I haven't been in the military, but I have such huge respect for those of you who have protected our nation. The freedoms that we can, that we can have today, uh, that we're blessed with, to just sing here in f with freedom without someone barging through. Well, we'll get to that in a minute. Is because of how you've protected us and protected this nation. So we honor you. You know, I looked up the, the Marines Code, you know, the, the Marine Code, and honor, courage, commitment. And I read through that yesterday. Honor, courage, and commitment. And I thought, boy, so many of those principles to apply to the ministry, you, you could. Because let's face it, how, how many of you have been burned by someone in the church? How many of you have been burned by the church, right? Because the church are just, they're just people. They're just sinners. And so often we can become disillusioned when we get involved in ministry. But God in his grace and his mercy, mercy, he wants to start unwinding that stuff. He wants to untangle that stuff. Because he doesn't, the, the one thing the enemy wants to do is he wants to sideline us and render us ineffective for the glory of God. But yet your greatest calling of your life, you were created to worship God. You were created by God with the ultimate purpose of bringing glory to God. And if, and if God, and if the enemy can sideline us from living out a life that is glorifying God in every way, he's going to do it. And how he does it, he accesses all of our disappointments and our hurts and all these things, and then we, we become cynical and we're, we're ineffective, okay? And what our hearts are craving in community, I believe our hearts are craving family, intimacy. I, I believe our hearts are craving uh, purpose, and being linked arm in arm with like-minded people, building something for the glory of God, fellow workers. And our hearts are craving fellow soldiers. And when you look, when I read that code, what it said to me is these Marines get, they're in the trenches and they, they have each other's back. That's what it means. I'm not going to leave you no matter what. I will lay down my life to, to save your life. I will never turn my back on you. See, this is the code. And how amazing would it be to exist as a community, a gospel-centered community, where you are locked arm in arm, 
not only as fellow workers, but fellow soldiers, knowing I've got your back. Hey, do you know that we can have that kind of relationship? Not because we're great people, but because we have the gospel. Let me explain. What the gospel has done for us is we couldn't save ourselves. We were rebelling against God. That's when God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for me in my worst state because I needed help. So God just didn't say, hey, Pete, I love you. Just, just figure it out. I love you. No, he said, he, God the Father gave everything just to have me. He, he essentially exchanged <laughs> his precious son who committed no sin so he could have me. That's how much value I have to him. And now because of Jesus, all my sins are forgiven. They're, they're forgiven. Forgiven. The debt has been canceled. And I am positioned in Christ, meaning that God relates to me just, of it, just had I not sinned. He sees me through the lens of the righteousness of Christ. He's taken my sin, nailed it to the cross, and then given me his righteousness. That's who you are positionally in Christ right now, whether you feel like it or not. That's what the Bible says. That's the reality. Okay, here's where I'm going with this. How can we have that kind of relationship where I've got your back, that we're in the trenches together? You don't have to worry about a thing because here's, here's how it works is in spite of my inconsistencies and your inconsistencies and my faults and my character flaws, we can view each other and relate to each other just as God relates to us. That's what the gospel does. If God is relating to me in the righteousness of Christ, how is God now going to, if we're going to be a gospel community, relate to each other? And what God wants to start to do, he helps us start to relating to each other through grace. That we are a church that is, we're walking in grace for ourselves and for one another. That's, that's why even when there's inconsistencies in character, we can still have each other's back because God has our back through Jesus Christ. That's why I love communion. When we share communion, I know we come up and we take it, but it's, a, it's just like the name says. We're, we're a community, communion. It's, a same, it's the same thing. That we're reminding each other, hey, man, I know you blew it this week, but this is the body of Christ. Take it. It's for you. And, and I know that you messed up this week, and I know you're struggling in this area, but I'm here as your brother to remind you the shed blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you from all sin. You are forgiven. Now we need that. And that's what it means to be a fellow soldier because this is a fight. We're in a fight. We battle, we battle not against flesh and blood, we read in Ephesians chapter 6, but we, we battle against powers and principalities in the air. Just as much as you're sitting here now seeing me and I'm seeing you, there's an unseen realm that exists right now at this very moment. In this room, above this roof, around this town, there's an unseen realm. And there are angels and there are demons and there's a battle going on. And they're all mixed up in this messed up society and they, they, this battle gets to us and it messes with our minds and it you know, the, the enemy whispers lies to us and reminds us of things we've done in the past and all the th things that we're not in now and gets us all tripped up. This is a battle that we're in. We need fellow soldiers in this battle. And this isn't just some... <laughs> it, it's not some uh, motivational speech, okay? This is what the Holy Spirit is already doing in us. You get it? That's what he's doing. And so when he looked at Epaphroditus, he said, he's my brother, he's my fellow worker, he's, our, he's my fellow soldier. And that kind of, it's, it's, a, it's a model relationship, I believe, in, in the church, in the community of Christ, okay? What we see in Epaphroditus is that he was laying down his life 
right? He, he lived recklessly. Look, he said, hey, he was kind of bummed out because he thought you were worried when he was sick, and he didn't, he didn't want you to worry about him. Have you ever met someone, and you haven't seen them in a long time, and they go, did you know I was sick, right? And they kind of have that, like, where were you? You know, that kind of thing. I'm like, I didn't know. Sorry, you know. He, Epaphroditus is like, no, I'm, I'm all good. I'm in God's hands. But what we see in Epaphroditus is that he put his life on the line, that he understood that there was a danger in ministering to the gospel. And there is danger. Now, last week, last Sunday, what a horrible event took place in Sutherland Springs, Texas. 26 people killed. And this week, we had right in this room, we do a monthly prayer meeting with, with pastors from all over the Canal Valley, and we hosted, One Love hosted that this last um, uh, Tuesday. But we were talking all about this, and I shared the diva, and I was talking about Jonah and how God was saying to Jonah, man, I love these people of Nineveh. Can't I love these people? I was just talking about how God is so much more compassionate than we realize, than we ever thought. But we talked about what to do, and they were, tell, they were saying, you know, we got, we didn't, but some of the pastors were saying, people are calling, like, are we, like, we need more guns in the church, right? We need to make sure all of our ushers are packing and they're, they're ready to go. We need to, okay, that's fine, whatever. But here's the thing. More than ever, what we need is the church to be mobilized and armed with the compassion of Jesus Christ. You're saying, well, wait a second, that's messing with me. I understand, I get the anger. But what I was reminded of was this. Do you remember back in 2006 when 10 Amish girls were killed at school? Remember? And then the gunman killed himself. And what the world saw that following week flipped everybody out. They saw the whole Amish community come around the, the parents and the family of the killer and bring meals and stay with them, and pray with them, and say, we forgive you. This is not your fault. God loves you. God's going to work this out for the good. And the media could not handle it. They couldn't take it. What do you mean? Because it makes no sense. My friends, this is the kingdom of God. This is the body of Christ that lives out a compassionate grace that startles the world because you know that's what Jesus did for us what he did on the cross startled the world it makes no sense why he would lay down his life for people that hated him and rejected him but that's what Jesus did should we be safer absolutely do I love you and your children enough to bring the fullest protection for, for them absolutely we take that very seriously here when we, we, the, when we have your kids over here, every safety precaution. Hey, do you pack for the safety of you and your family and me? Amen. But that's not the answer. That's the, the, what the world will see. And, and I believe that that's, that it's just a conviction to us. And so we all gathered as pastors. We prayed to that end. So... This is a dangerous calling. When we look at Epaphroditus, there was danger. And let's not think that there's not danger when we go out and we fulfill God's plan for our life and God's will for our life. But what I love is that when he says here in verse 29, receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness. Um, well, in verse 28, therefore I sent him the more earnestly that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such men in esteem. What I love about this is Epaphroditus is carrying this letter and he's saying, I want you to receive this letter. And they read it in the church, but then they'd pass around the letters to the different fellowships around. So this, would, this letter would have eventually been circulated to all the churches, okay? This epistle to Philippians. But what he's saying here is, I want you, remember, 
19 times the Apostle Paul uses, says the word rejoice or joy. This is the epistle of joy. He's just calling the church to rejoice in the Lord. We're going to see in a little bit. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. He wants us to be full of joy in the midst of this life. But he says, I'm sending this letter to you so that not only will you get the words on a piece of paper, but you're going to get the tone behind what I'm writing here. That's what he's saying. And Epaphroditus is going to bring along with this letter a big smile and a lot of laughter and a lot of encouragement because tone means everything, doesn't it? means so much. When, you know, we don't have a dog right now, but I could say to my dog, I could, I could say, you're, the, you're just the nastiest little mutt dog, ugly, stinking, with a big smile on my face with just a nice tone, you're worth, you're good for nothing, dog, you know, and his tail would be wagging and his tongue, I'd just be insulting him up and down, and, but my tone is what, you know, makes the contact, or if I had a stern tone, I love you, dog, you've been the best dog I've ever, you know, and he'd cower away, even though everything I'm saying is complimentary, hey, tone is everything, isn't it? And so when we, when we speak the truth, when we speak with one another, when we share the scripture, let, let's get the tone. And here's the tone, and let me close with this. The tone of the Lord Jesus Christ. When he's, we need to get a vision of who he is. When he says, speaks to us, and he communicates to us, Let's also get the tone of his heart for us. God loves you so much. He's smiling on you. I love Zephaniah where the Bible says he's dancing over us. He's singing over us. This is God's heart for you right now this morning. He loves you not only with words on a page, but, but he, he wants to be with you. Each and every morning that you wake up, you're bringing delight to the heart of the Father when we just spend time with him. He's just eagerly wanting to walk with us and spend time with us. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And may the Holy Spirit give us spiritual eyes to help us to see Jesus in all of his glory and in all of his truth, but in the brilliance and the wonder of his char character. He's the wonderful counselor Amen. that loves you and is walking with you. He's not mad at you. He just wants to, everything in God's heart wants to, encourage, wants to encourage you. That's the tone of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray this week that you would, Lord, that the Lord would help us be like Timothy's, Epaphroditus's, but more than that, it would be born out of just a sweet fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the message of the gospel that we see, Lord. And I look, we look at these men and we see the meekness and the servanthood. We see that they, Lord, are serving the body. Lord, we pray that you would, Lord, cause us to be brothers and sisters, fellow workers, fellow soldiers, in this difficult world, God. And um, we thank you that that's what you're doing, even now, right now, in us and through us. It's not us, it's you. It's you in us. And so we want, Lord, to grow. We want our character to be that, this mind in us, which was also in Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right.